that God has used events of the Exodus in order to show us the character of the kingdom of God. The events of the Exodus really are prophetic. Notice that Luke, in arranging his uh, gospel, uses the Exodus as the model by which he describes the coming of Jesus Christ and his crucifixion uh, and departure. In fact, in the mountain of transfiguration, when Christ talked with Moses and Elijah, they talked with him about the Exodus. The King James translates it death, but the term is Exodus. About the Exodus which he must accomplish in Jerusalem. So that Christ, as the last man Adam, as the fulfillment of all of prophecy and of all of the law, Christ leads the Exodus that is prefigured and already seen in the Exodus from the land of Egypt. So that uh, we see then in the events of the Exodus a prophecy of the events and the course of this world order. This means then that we must understand providence to be directly related to the manner in which God relates to evil. I would uh, suggest to you in terms of dealing with uh, apologetics on evil that you should read T.S. Eliot, uh, a, um, at one time the poet laureate of England, a uh, very deep uh, uh, theological thinker, and C.S. Lewis. Uh, C.S. Lewis, especially in the Screwtape Letters and the Great Divorce and other works of that nature, uh, deals with uh, these issues of good and evil in the world. Francis Schaeffer has done some good work uh, as well in terms of apologetics throughout uh, the, uh, the deal, uh, the uh, issues of Christian apologetics. But the doctrine of divine providence comes down to such statements as this. Exodus 4, 1. And the Lord said unto him, that is to Moses, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb? Or the deaf? Or the seeing? Or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Um, we have to recognize that these things occur under specific direction. Isaiah 45, 7. God speaking, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. You must understand that the Bible uses the term evil not simply in the moral sense, but it also uses the term evil in the sense of pestilence. Uh, or of uh, any of the things that we refer to as tragedies, refer to as evil. Then Amos 3, verse 6, Shall a trumpet be blown in the city, and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in the city, and the Lord hath not done it? Uh, the NIV uh, translated this way, When a trumpet uh, sounds in a city, do not the people tremble, when disaster comes to a city, does not the Lord cause it, or has not the Lord caused it? And so we come always uh, to the issue of uh, when bad things, as we put the question, when bad things happen to good people. And we attempt to work through that uh, in terms of a theodicy. I am offended by those people who try to answer this by saying none of us is good. So the question basically turns out to be why shouldn't these things happen to us? That's not the point. The point is that God does regard the righteousness of the righteous. We so often quote this statement or misquote the statement all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. 
if that means what many people think it means, it's counterproductive. It means there's no point in believing, there's no point in obeying, there's no point in testifying, there's no point in preaching. Uh, none of the things that God says He is pleased with actually please Him. If everything that we say is as filthy rag. If you look at the context of that scripture, it is the offering of false sacrifices. The, off, the attempt to, make, to create righteousness out of physical obedience. The attempt to create righteousness out of legalism. Uh, the attempt to create righteousness without a heart wholly dedicated to God. This kind of righteousness, the righteousness which we manufacture, is certainly an offense to God. <clears throat> and is the rags before God. I think also that in this issue <clears throat> of uh, the bad things happening to good people, we probably uh, are only half aware of the manner in which God deals with us. You hear people raise the question very often, I don't know why God is so good to me, but not very often. Uh, when uh, success comes, uh, we don't ask the why question. Uh, when benefits come, we seldom ask the why question. It is when evil comes. We have uh, a child born with a severe uh, defect, physical or neurological. We are racked with cancer. Or, as in Illinois, the day before yesterday, now seven children have died because of a, probably a malfunction in the light. Um, and so then we raise the questions of why. I do not rebuke people for raising that question. I simply point out that I think, uh, first of all, the why question is inevitable. Ask in Scripture. Job raised the question. The psalmist raised the question repeatedly. Um, but the why question is not really an effectual question. It is not a productive question. The questions which we ask ought to be asked <clears throat> in such a way as to cultivate our spiritual graces. We need to ask questions that in the course of the asking we grow in grace. Um, and we also need to be prepared for answers which are not according to our presupposition. God answers, but He does not answer with the questions and the answers that we attempt to dictate by the manner in which we ask the questions. God answers correcting our value system. Left to ourselves, we can see no value in pain. Left to ourselves, we can see no value in the cross. And we would have avoided the cross. And even knowing the essentiality of the cross, we still try to avoid it. And I'm using the term we not just as a euphemism for editorial. I'm using it we to be inclusive of all here. God also answers questions in order that we may know the way His grace works. And the way His grace works is through the cross. God also answers us because He wants us to know how He handles our afflictions so that we may know that our afflictions are under divine control. So He teaches us not so much to ask the why question, but to ask the question, what can I do to glorify God? How can I glorify God in this situation? So God wishes us then to ask questions that build our faith. 
He also wants us to ask questions that have the perspective of eternity. For we were born for eternity. We are not born with inherent eternal life, but we were born with a trajectory that has eternity in mind. And God wants us to ask those questions. Our questions should not imply that God has singled us out for special punishment. And yet, uh, this is very often the case. What have I done uh, that the Lord is punishing me in this way? Our questions also should not imply that God owes us an immunity from trouble. Because He does not. Not only does he not owe it, he would not give it to us either. Our questions then should move us to deeper insights into the character of God and the nature of his providence. And our questions should also help us face the reality that we are always, uh, actually rather, we may actually be under judgment. I think we sometimes too quickly assure people that God is not punishing them when they know in their hearts that God is punishing them. That they are under a chastisement for their failure to do the will of God and to follow in the character of divine will. So we must not uh, then yield to easy fix uh, to say, no, God is not judging you under these circumstances. It may be that He is. And this requires deep heart search. I sat uh, several years ago with a group of believers at a retreat. And uh, among those people there was a woman who had lost her mother and her stepfather, but with whom she was very closely related as if her father, by a terrible murder, invasion of their home. Uh, and her mother and father were murdered. Another couple had just had to lose a business, which, uh, and with that, uh, the threatened loss of their house. They were still in the struggle as to whether they would have to appeal to bankruptcy or not. There were several other uh, tragedies, but those are the ones that stand out. And uh, we asked them uh, how they handled that in their own lives. The one thing that, the two things that came up most prominently was that uh, they were comforted by the presence of God and that the new God was working out this for their good. And that he would be in it. The other was that I can't wait to get back to my own church because that was to them the community of faith that nurtured them especially. The psalmist, and he uh, faced the uh, progress of evil in the world and the uh, prosperity of evil people. He says, when I thought to know this, it was too hard for me until I went into the sanctuary. So, the issue then of the answer to these questions uh, is an issue of thanksgiving, an issue of praise, an issue of divine worship. The response to tragedy must always be a response of worship. It must be that we run into the arms of God, who is the one who We run into the arms of God, who is the one who is in control, and under whose government this death has occurred. Under whose government we have lost this child. Under whose government we are suffering with the pangs of cancer. Under whose government we are suffering with the difficulties of a stroke. So that 
Instead of running from God, we run toward God. As He is sovereign over the affliction, He is sovereign over the comfort. And there can, to my mind, be no greater paradigm for this particular issue than the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Certainly, our Lord Jesus is the incarnation of God. He is the love of God walking among us. He is the holiness of God in the flesh. He is all that God is. So He comes into an evil world. An evil world that would treat Him as evil because He is good. You know, we tend to think that whatever is not like us is bad. I've referred to the uh, story of the blind, that uh, the uh, people had lived with their blindness for so long and everybody in the tribe was blind, uh, that uh, they thought uh, blindness uh, was good. That's normal. And they thought being able to see was evil. That's bad. So that when a unfortunate man fell into their community uh, by way of an airplane crash, as the story goes, they nurtured him back to hell, even to the point that he could see. And he fell in love with one of the young women of the of the blind tribe, and. Uh, they had a town council. Yes, you can marry our daughter, provided you will get rid of the evil of sight. So let us pluck your eyes out, and you will become normal and right. And you can marry our daughter. This is precisely what happened when Jesus Christ, the holiness of God, appeared in the world. They treated his virgin birth as if it were morally suspect. They treated his presence in the world as if it were a threat to, the politi to political stability. As a result of that, innocent children were slain uh, in and around Bethlehem. The Lord himself escaped. And so many people very often raise the question, why was I spared? And they have a guilt trip over that. But even the Lord Jesus was spared, and others were sacrificed. Not in order for Him to live, but they were sacrificed because of the evil uh, in the world in which He appeared. He came back into the world and He began to minister. And they faulted Him for what He taught, they accused him of uh, casting out demons by the Elzebub. They attempted to stone him. They threatened to uh, cast his followers uh, out of the, uh, the, the synagogue for following him or even professing these things. He was despised by his own family. And he was despised not because he was doing anything wrong, but he was despised because he was doing good. And we have to recognize that there are times when the reason we suffer is that we are doing right. But there are also times that we can make no sense of the suffering at all. We can handle it if we can get an answer. But when we can't get an answer, we are thrown on to faith and we don't like it. Because uh, we much prefer living by sight. We much prefer living with man-made explanations and not with the character of walking by faith in God. So that Jesus Christ comes to the pinnacle of His life. In one sense, the pinnacle of His life is the transfiguration. Because here, He is uh, elevated by God 
He is seen in transfigured kingdom glory. He is in community with Moses and Elijah. And what do they talk about? They talk about the exodus which he must accomplish in Jerusalem. And so, he descends the Mount of Transfiguration only to ascend Mount Calvary. And here, our Lord was put to death. He was put to death under accusation of evil. He was put to death uh, under all kinds of humiliation. Don't ever think that the problems that Christ went through in his trials <coughs> simply passed off of him like water off a duck back. Have you ever had anybody spit in your face? Most of us have not even had somebody spit on our foot. But we probably knock them down for doing that. Uh, have you ever had anybody accuse you of lying? Uh, especially when you knew that you were absolutely true in that. Not a mistake. Why? Have you ever had anybody uh, tell you that what you said about God was a blasphemy? When you knew that you were telling what was true about God, that you were revealing true God. So Jesus comes to this point of his suffering. And the epistle of the Hebrews says concerning him that he learned obedience through suffering. If this is the way of obedience for the Redeemer, there can be no other way of learning obedience for the redeemed. The redeemed must learn obedience through suffering. And the Redeemer was perfected through suffering. And if it is the way of the Redeemer to be perfected through suffering, it is the way of the redeemed to be perfected through sufferings. So that it is in this light that we are to understand Calvary. We have to know then that we were born for eternity. But in this stage of our existence, the only route to eternity is the cross, as it was for Jesus. The only route to eternity is death, as it was for Jesus. The only route to the resurrection is the crucifixion, as it was for Jesus. So that uh, there is no way that we ought to seek a life free from suffering. <coughs> Please do not misunderstand. I am not urging an asceticism in which one seeks to suffer. I am not urging an asceticism in which one uh, glorifies the putting of the body. Uh, the body is not evil. Uh, I am instead urging the uh, character of knowing that the cross is the gateway to glory. So, we have many biblical examples. Consider Joseph. There was no way that, uh, as we know the story, obviously God could have had other ways to do what he did. But the story as it stands, there was no way for Israel to be saved if Joseph had not been sold into Egypt. Uh, there was no way for him to have ascended uh, to the uh, second in command unless he had been in prison. And in every case, Joseph had evil done to him because he was a man. Uh, and that uh, he simply served the purposes uh, of man, uh, of, of God in fulfilling that. So let me conclude by a homily, which I did uh, some years back. It will repeat some of the things that I've already said. 
But it is a homily developed out of Psalm 73, verses 16 and 17. And I put it this way. I believe in life, but I do not believe in life after death. There is one life, and it will not soon be passed. The one life that is, is forever. It was intended to be so by God when He created that life, and He placed in that life the aims and the potentials to be developed for Him. For we see a young man, or a woman, or an infant, a teenager, die by accident. They're struck down by disease or by murder. Questions whirl in our minds about an untimely death. We weep and sometimes become angry over the tragedy, the injustice, the pain, the suffering, and myriad other questions that arise in our minds. Most of these questions are why. <coughs> Many of them do not strengthen our faith, they instead weaken our faith. So the questions we ask should involve three things. First, our questions, not just the answers, should build up our faith. Second, our questions should take the perspective of eternity. And third, our questions should ask what instead of why. We are programmed to think that all answers mark the progress in our understanding, but that is not true. The fact is that our questions mark progress in our understanding or deterioration in our understanding. These questions um, should not accuse God with implications of injustice or lack of wisdom. Our questions should not imply that God is violating His covenant with us by failing to give us an umbrella against the storms of life. God does not give believers immunity from tragedy from reverses, from illness, or other difficulties of a sin-cursed world order. These kinds of questions lead only to anger, or questions of conscience, questions of our conscience, that we can never resolve. <coughs> our questions should not view God as any other than a loving, gracious, holy, merciful, heavenly Father, who is infinitely wise in what He allows. Our questions should move us to deeper insights into the character of God. And so how do we ask these questions? Where do we go for guidance? We go for guidance through the examples in Holy Scripture, where we see godly men such as uh, Joseph and Job working through these questions. And yet I don't want to lay, on, lay people into a guilt trip by asking the inappropriate questions. Job said some things about God and to God that would have frightened me to death to have said. But God still says that in this illness, he or tribulation, he had not sinned against God. There's one thing we can rest assured of is that God can take it. You, you don't need to be afraid that you're going to do anything to God by the question. God can be much more absorbent to our inappropriate questions than you and I can be when we hear those questions. Because we have an imperfect sense of reverence and the holiness of God. So that while we're asking these questions, even if they're inappropriate, God wants to give us deeper understanding. He is strengthening our faith. He is working patience in us. Our question should help us to realize that the answer can itself cultivate our faith. The demand for an answer to every question is not the characteristic of the lifestyle of faith. Such a demand assumes that we have a wisdom that we do not have. And it assumes that we have a wisdom that we're even incapable of. As for patience, we demand it immediately. As the man said in his report, I asked you for patience last night, where is it? Um, so 
so that uh, the questions must have the perspective of eternity. And they must understand God's purposes are eternal. When applied to individual lives, God's purposes envision the eternal goal of each individual. Um, God's ultimate purpose for us, each of us, is not time but eternity. A mortal life snuffed out in, each, in infancy still has an eternal purpose. It has an eternity uh, to be fulfilled and to fulfill the glory of God. This is why I emphasize the life begun in conception is the same life that is to be lived in eternity. We talk about the talents that will never be developed. God doesn't. We talk about the potential that will never be fulfilled. You see, what we envision as appropriate to this mortal sphere, God envisions as appropriate to eternity. And in that light, we must understand God's purposes. Certainly it's heart-rending for us to give up the dreams of accomplishment in a bright child that is snuffed out by sudden illness or by lingering illness or by uh, an accident, automobile accident or even murder. It's maddening for us to bear the injustice that other people impose on us in many of these deaths, drunk drivers, murderers, careless corporations, inept physicians, corrupt judiciaries, and many more. But what does disturb me in the judicial system that we have today is that, um, take the OJ case, forgive me for bringing it up, but it illustrates the point. On both sides, the issue is not justice. Um, the issue is human anger. That's the whole point. Uh, notice the case was just decided in Houston yesterday, or day before yesterday, perhaps. The um, followers of Selena, they rejoiced out of hatred for the woman who was convicted of uh, murder uh, entertainer. You have people standing around the gates of the penitentiaries where executions occur, and they send up a shout of joy when it is announced that so-and-so has just died. He has been executed. This is not God. Whatever you think of capital punishment, that is not God. So that uh, we do this, however, because we become so mixed with the value system of this world order and because we become so corrupted by the perspectives of this mortal life. So we must know that God's healing is always redemptive. I don't mean simply the healing of the body, any healing. God's healing is always redemptive. This is why healing is providing the atonement. And yet the redemptive healing and our deliverance is not primarily immediate. Redemptive healing is primarily for eternity. Even when we are healed, we're still going to die. Even when Lazarus was raised from the dead, he had to die again. Uh, maybe I'm quirky in the way I think. But have you ever thought of the terrible injustice that was done to Lazarus? <laughs> and here this guy is not appointed to die once, but he's appointed to die twice. <laughs> And, uh, and yet, uh, this is the kind of thing we wish until we get it. So, we are born mortal. It doesn't really matter how this life ends. It is going to end. And it is going to end under sovereignty. Our purpose is to live harmoniously with that sovereignty and to praise God in the process of living and of dying. That's right. And what is even harder, to praise God in the process of seeing our loved ones live and die.
Most of us are entirely willing to say, take me, Lord, uh, and spare her or him. But divine healing also provides for the healing that occurs under all circumstances of life. So it is a benefit of God's grace when we are chastised by the Lord. And I take this word chastised not primarily as punitive, but I take it as the meaning of the word originally, the child king of the Lord, which means all of the things that God has to do to bring us to maturity, to bring us to perfection, to bring us to the purposes that he has for us. So, we not only thank God for the outcome of the journey, we thank him for the journey because the way of the cross leads home. It's true for Jesus, it's true for the disciples. These are the ways in which we can understand at least a part of the issues of theodicy. I see I've used up the time, so no time for questions, but I'm sure that you can raise for the next week when we come together. Thank you.